Hello out there in Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preachers Podcast. The podcast where podcasting is somewhere between a hobby and a criminal activity. Well, today we're going to talk about um, uh, biblical iner- inerrancy. <clears throat> and that's not a discussion that happens in a vacuum. Um, there's a fellow out there. I, I, I assume he's a man. And he has a uh, an apologetics-themed uh, YouTube channel kind of thing. And he calls that channel Testify. Now, Mr. Testify, uh, that's probably not his real name, uh, he posted a rather lengthy quote from a, uh, a 19th century scholar named George Park Fisher. Now, Mr. Fisher had written way back in the day uh, that what he would call discrepant accounts uh, between different Gospels are not a deal breaker when it comes to uh, believing the Gospel. Um, because, here's a quote, it must be remembered that these books are not formal histories, they are memoirs. So Mr. Park Fisher, uh, Mr. George Park Fisher, his opinion is is that it doesn't matter if there are errors in your Bible because uh, these are just books written by men. Okay, so so as the guy who literally has spent hours defending individual word choices in the Bible, I, I disagreed, as you as you might have imagined. And with all respect to Mr. Fisher, um, that approach uh, that it doesn't matter because these aren't you know that really important. That approach and that mindset is not only wrong, but is a dangerous concession to skeptics. Anyway, in a, in a comment, I raised my concerns, and Mr. Testify graciously uh, sent me an article by a guy named Jonathan McClatchy that Testify felt would you know, really further explain uh, the position, this position. And if I remember, I will include a link to this article because it's something like 16 foot noted pages long. Um. So I had thoughts on all this, and and and, and uh, I'm not real great at the at the YouTube comment section uh, of keeping a, a consistent train of thought. So I told Mister Testify that uh, in my experience, the comment section in YouTube is a very poor place uh, to have a really a quality discussion. Uh, you know, instead of talking to a person, you're talking to the entire internet, kind of thing. So instead, I uh, opted to gather my thoughts and and try to form those thoughts into something halfway coherent and then and then present it here on the Street Preacher's Corner uh, for all the world to see. And I'm, I'm going to try to uh, post or tag or whatever the word is, Mr. Testify, so that he knows that, you know, that we're doing this in good faith. Uh, it is important to note uh, going forward before we get too far into this uh, is that Mr. Testify and Mr. McClatchy and even the uh, dearly departed brother, Mr. Fisher, are not my enemy. And I'm not, my goal is not to... Uh, own them or destroy them or whatever term the internet goobers cook up next to delineate you know a disagreement um, I extend to them the benefit of the doubt and 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 their approach though it's you know it's a little prim- pragmatic for my taste it looks like makes the testify has got a good channel he's got he's got some good stuff in there uh, I think he relies a little heavily on scholarship and my and, and, and in my opinion um you know, when in doubt, throw scholarship out because most of what passes for Bible scholarship is not scholarship at all. It is Bible correcting in an attempt to sell a book or get an audience. Probably something I don't want to get into, but what we do here on the Street Preacher's Corner, that's real scholarship. We look at individual words, we chase their origins, we define them, we comply them, we we dig, we dig, we pray, we fast, we beg God for wisdom. That's how real biblical scholarship works. Uh but anyway, so so I I want to extend to them to the benefit of the doubt and 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 the way they the way they look at this this issue the issue of biblical inerrancy, I believe it flow it looks like it to me anyway it looks like it flows from a sincere desire and a sincere effort to address the objections of skeptics and scorners, but the solution they put forth that you just concede uh, the area the era of inerrancy, uh, their solution is in my opinion um, much much worse than the problem. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you what I think, and then I'm going to tell you why I think it. I'm, I'm, I'm going to define some words, and then I'm going to try to use those definitions consistently. I'll try to be fair to those I disagree with. I will try to stay on track, and I will try not to sound like a pedantic idiot. That last part's probably going to be the hard one. So the Bible, and by Bible, I mean the one I have in my hand, is infallible, it's inerrant, and inspired. It's not a case where it used to be those things when it was a pile of, you know, long since departed originals. Uh, 
but it is still those things. The position that it used to be an errant or it used to be inspired in the originals is really weird to me. It's half-hearted because, after all, without the originals, which nobody has, uh, how would you even establish what the originals say? They say so, so people say the Bible is inspired and inerrant in the original autograph. So what they mean when they say that is they mean the letter that Paul wrote had no errors in it. But the version, the copy of the copy of the copy of Paul's letter that we have now might have errors in it. Well, how do you know the original had no errors in it? You don't have the original to look at. And even if you had the original to look at, uh, how would you establish that it had no errors? Is what I'm saying. Um, but anyway, so the, the position I take is that the Bible is infallible, it's inspired, it's inerrant. It still is. It was when it was penned, it was when it was spoken, and it still is. And that is apparently, in uh, in all of Christendom, a, uh, an extreme position. It's called uh, hard inerrancy, I believe, is the term that Mr. McClatchy used. Um, and, it's, and it's considered as, as, as an unreasonable position to some, an undefendable position to some. And, that, and that's okay. I'm okay with them thinking that about me. I'm okay with them thinking about that I'm extreme. I'm okay with them thinking of me that I am unreasonable. Uh, but hey, moving on. Inerrant, meaning without error, you know, obviously, uh, is, a, is not a Bible word per se, but it is a Bible concept. And so I would expand the definition. You know, the definition of inerrant is without error. I would expand that definition to include things like errors of omission or, or you know, so-called good faith errors, uh, which has been written down so many times that nobody mean, meant to mess it up, but they did. Um, or errors in translation. So that's not to say that every copy of every manuscript out there in the world is, is inerrant. That's, that's dumb. I mean, no, nobody with any brains, but somewhere out there exists the correct words. Somewhere out there exists the correct, uh, the correct words. So I believe the Bible in my hand uh, is free from errors, omissions, contradictions, and mistranslations. And apparently, uh, by planting my banner on that particular hill, I draw the ire and the fire of a lot of profession Christ- Christianity. And that's okay. I think some of the reason that these guys find themselves in this position is... Um, to say that the book you have in your hand is free of error and is infallible and all, all, all the attributes I've already given to it. Um, when you're faced with guys who who um, who are, you know, purported Bible scholars and they and they're saying that there are errors and here I am, I'm just some some nobody and I say that it's not. Well, that makes me seem, you know, anti-intellectual or anti scholarship and and really i'm okay with both those labels um like i said you you plant your you plant your banner on that particular hill if you say the book you have in your hand is perfect um apparently a lot of people who claim to believe that book will take issue with you on that and i don't frankly i don't i don't really understand that so now the bible does contain lies uh, in that it quotes liars and it contains errors and it records the errors of men inerrant inerrant means we have an accurate record of those lies and those errors and the events surrounding them. So it might be worth taking a slight detour here to consider what the Bible says about itself. And, and I think it's important to establish because Mr. McClatchy um, makes a very puzzling statement in his article. Uh, quote, Nowhere does Scripture unequivocally affirm inerrancy. Okay, well, I, I'm not even sure what he means by that. When the Bible talks about itself, it uses words like right in Psalm 33. The word of the Lord is right. And the words of the Lord are pure words, Psalm 12. And perfect, Psalm 19. So in fact, you could actually take a list, and I'm sure someone has, and you make a list of all the qualities and all the attributes that the Bible claims for itself. And we might be here for a while if we did that. Uh, so we're just, I'm just going to take these three. I'm going to take the, the, the qualities of right, pure, and perfect. It's a pretty quick litmus test. If it isn't right, and it isn't pure, and it isn't perfect, it doesn't qualify as Scripture according to Scripture. So a Scripture that isn't inerrant, a Scripture that contains errors, by definition, isn't a Scripture at all. It isn't God's Word at all. Uh, something that merely contains God's words, mixed in with a bunch of other stuff, is not God's Word. You know, I've written books, some of you, I've written articles, other than that, that contain God's words, but they aren't God's word because it's my stuff in there too. It's not hard to figure out. So, 
So, like I said, Mr. McClatchy says that it doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, affirm inerrancy. Well, it doesn't use that word, but it does say that it's right and pure and perfect. So that that's that's you know that's a functioning definition for me. Now, the term of the word of the Lord first shows up in Exodus. Or I'm sorry, Genesis fifteen one. And what follows, uh, you know, the word of the Lord came into Moses saying, and what follows is a direct quote from God. Now, there are scores of examples like this. Uh, you, you'll have, you'll have uh, you know, the word of the Lord came into Jeremiah saying, and then what happens then is a verbatim quote of what God said to an individual or, or, or to a group. It's called the word, and in the word consists of words, because when the word of the Lord came to, came to Moses, it wasn't just one word like, hey. I mean, it was it was a group of words. That group of words is referred to as the word of the Lord. Now, stick a pin in that because it doesn't stop there. Consider this, okay? Your Bible is not just a list of God quotes. I mean, that that, that would be really disjointed if you took every place uh, that God spoke in Scripture and you and you just you know put you know number one Genesis fifteen one and you quoted Genesis fifteen one the the part where God was actually speaking. And then you just made a list of things God had said. It would be a very disjointed list because there's no context to them. Um, excuse me. Uh, so, so this word that is made up of words, they have a, a situational context. They're, they are sometimes a verbal response to a situation or even the answer to a question. If the answer is right, pure, and perfect, and the answer is inerrant, infallible, inspired, is the question, does the question have those same qualities? So you ask God a question, God answers you. We know what God said was right. We know what God said was pure. We know God said was perfect. Is the thing you asked him, does it qualify in the same category? Now, some of you are already off the train. I know, I know. You're, you're wondering, what is this idiot yammering on about? Well, just just, just hang with me a little longer. Uh, in Exodus 4, for example, Moses is recounting, to the folks back home, you know, the children of Israel, his conversation with God in regards to, you know, uh, some other stuff, when when the word of the Lord came to him, and the entire narrative leading up to the, this verbatim quote is referred to as the word of the Lord. So, so not only do you have God's response, and that's right and pure and per- perfect, but Moses's, Moses's half of the conversation is just as inerrant because it's an, we have an accurate record of what Moses said, if that, if that makes sense. So if you, if, you, if you follow the phrase, word of the Lord, uh, throughout the whole Bible, throughout the whole Old Testament especially, you will find that it is God's word when it is said, Exodus 15.1. It is God's word when it is repeated. I'm sorry, Genesis 15.1. Uh, it is God's word when it re- is repeated, um, um, Genesis, or, sorry, Exodus 4. And then it is God's word when it's, it's written down in Jeremiah 36. So if it's God's word, then it is, by definition, right and pure, and perfect. It is, by definition, inerrant. And it is important that you not give that ground up. I'll I'll tell you why in a second here. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ himself had so much confidence in what Moses, uh, in Moses' account, that he said, if you don't believe Moses, you don't believe me. And while on the subject, Jesus vouched for some other things that the, that the, the, uh, uh, errant crowd uh, doesn't endorse. Uh, Jesus vouched for uh, uh, the veracity of people like Adam and, and, and accounts like Jonah's. I've met people who said they believed in Jesus, but they weren't sure about Adam, which is really strange because, I mean, Paul's entire explanation in Romans 5 about the necessity of Christ's sacrifice is based off of, built off of, Adam being a real person and the account of Adam uh, penned by Moses, being right, pure, and perfect. I mean, Adam was not only real, uh, but we have an errant, infallible, inspired account of his life. Think about this. If there's no Adam, then Christ's sacrifice on the cross doesn't make a whole lot of sense. If if Adam is not the first man, which he's called in 1 Corinthians, and we're not all gener- generated from Adam, then the verse in Romans 5, where, whereas by one, men's, one man sin entered the world, and death by sin, and death had passed upon all, for that all have sinned. See, without, without an Adam, then there's no need for a Jesus. If Adam was just one branch of a family tree, or, or, or you know, the, most, the, first, the first evolved man, or whatever, you want to, whatever kind of nonsense you want to put out there, uh, if that's the case, then, then it makes no sense for Christ to go to the cross. Whereas by one man sin entered the world, and death by sin. 
So, so if you say, for example, okay, look, look, well, one of the dangers when we back off on the subject of inerrancy is that the entire fabric of Scripture comes unraveled. If you say, for example, that Luke can, uh, correctly quoted Jesus, but was a little fuzzy on what Jesus said or, or where Jesus said it or who was there when Jesus said it, then the whole foundation for believing the gospel comes crashing down. Not only did these things happen, there's two questions you got to ask. Did these things happen? And do we have an accurate record of these things happening? And if you say these things happened, but we don't have a necessarily have an accurate record, all we have is a reliable record, well then how reliable? I mean, how many errors are you going to let in your Bible before you concede that it's no longer reliable? And how would you know where those errors are? Now, Mr. McClatchy, uh, who wrote the article, as well as some folks in the comment section, they seem to think that the, it is unfair or inconsistent to hold the Bible to a higher standard than, say, an eyewitness account of the sinking of the Titanic. If you've got somebody that was on the Titanic and you have their, their eyewitness account, uh, you know, we are willing to concede uh, that, that this person may may not know exactly where they were when this happened or that happened, or they may incorrectly, uh, you know, remember who was there. And we, we, we allow that. And, and they would, the Mr. McClatchy's crowd would say that it is in, unfair and inconsistent to hold the Bible to a higher standard. No, no, it's not. Now, Carl Sagan got one thing right in his entire Christ rejecting life. He used to say extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Look, the sinking of the Titanic may be, uh, you know, tragic or dramatic, and you might even get a really terrible movie out of it, but it's not unusual or unthinkable that a ship, you know, which is made of metal, which weighs more than water, um, would sink if you tear a hole in the side of it. That eyewitness account never claims to be right, pure, and perfect. It never claims to be inerrant, inspired, infallible. It certainly never claims to be the thing that a man is judged by. Now think about this. Your Bible claims to be alive. Your Bible claims to know you and to know the future. It claims, among many, many things, that an innocent man in a successfully, uh, uh, an innocent man was successfully executed. And that not only he got up from the dead, but he's still alive today. Now, if the Bible is not is not completely true, and I've, I've said this all, all my saved life, if the Bible is not completely true, then it is the most insane pack of fairy tales that anyone ever tried to pass off as being true. Now, I'm willing to allow, when, I, when we talk about inerrancy, I'm willing to allow uh, the Bible to contain figures of speech, uh, metaphors, analogies, similes, uh, especially when it's men talking to each other or God trying to explain something to a bunch of hard-headed men. But if the Scripture says it happened on a Tuesday, and we could unequivocally prove that it happened on a Thursday, then you ought to throw the whole shooting match out. Because if it can't get little things right, like the day of the week, or who was there, then you shouldn't expect it to have big things right, like did Christ really rise from the dead? As I said before, I want to extend to everybody involved the benefit of the doubt. Mr. Testify, Mr. McClutchy, and others, you know, they, they, they have run into scoffers and skeptics, mostly on the internet. Uh, maybe that's not fair to say. My my understanding of Mr. Testify's uh, ministry and his outreach is that most of his conversations take place on the internet. And 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 if you've been around very long, you know that I don't I don't hold that in as, in, in as high a regard as some other things. It's better than doing nothing, but it's it's not better than doing nothing by much. But Mr. Testify, Mr. McClutchy, and others. They have run into scoffers and they've run into skeptics who throw difficult patches, pass, passages at their feet like it's some sort of trophy of agnosticism. Uh, and, and their response, at least in a couple of cases, is, is, in my opinion, is to surrender valuable, important ground as if it doesn't matter. To those men and others like them, uh, I would like to point out two things. First, and this is important you get this. Skeptics are skeptics for a reason. And while I will not question the, the, the sincerity of my brothers in Christ, I will absolutely question the sincerity of a Christ-rejecting reprobate. The Bible says, 
Light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, for their deeds were evil. A man rejects the Bible, not because of all the great evidences against it, not because Darwin was so clever, not because Christopher Hitchens came up with some really cool analogy. Men reject the scriptures because they, for the most part, they reject the scriptures because they have dirty hearts and dirty lives. Okay? They're skeptics for a reason. These fellows don't necessarily want an answer. They want an argument. And you are not obligated to endlessly engage insincere people in debate, which the Bible says it's a work of the flesh anyway, according to Galatians 5. It is akin, it is, it is like uh, trying to teach a pig how to sing. You know, it wastes your time and, and it irritates the pig. Um, secondly, uh, the Bible never, never claims or even attempts uh, to address every question or every objection a man could possibly cook up. It tells a man what he needs to know, and it is entirely possible while fulfilling that function uh, that it doesn't give you the information to fully harmonize. This is another word people use a lot to harmonize the passage to make two two verses uh, that appear to say something different say some say the same thing. That that information may not be out there. That information may not exist. The information that you would need or that I would need to fully harmonize or the skeptic would need to fully harmonize the, the satisfaction to your satisfaction, the passage to your satisfaction or my satisfaction, our satisfaction uh, isn't the point. The answer sometimes is, I don't know. The answer sometimes is, nobody knows. People say, why did God do this? Why did God do that? And I tell them, unless he wrote down why he did it, all I've got is speculation. And my speculation is no more valid than yours. Sometimes you got to just say, I don't know. Now, in his article, Mr. McClatchy brings up three or four sort of thorny passages in the Gospels uh, where the timing of the events or the sequence of events isn't super clear. And I've, I've covered some of those when we're going through Mark. I've covered uh, uh, the order of things and how that, and, and, and we'll cover more of that. Um, but anyway, he, he looks at these three or four thorny passages in the Gospels, particularly in the Gospels, where he can't make things jive to his satisfaction or the, or the satisfaction of the person challenging him. And he will cite these as uh, proof of errors in the gospel that he claims to believe, which to me is a strange way to approach that thing. Honestly, Mr. McClatchy, if you're listening to this, man, get, drop me a line. I mean, I'm not that hard to find. We, we, I'm trying to understand what's going on with you. Uh, so so if, you see, if, if you look at this and you say that, that's proof of error in the gospel that I just told you is true, see, in doing so, you're, you're taking the exact position using some of the same passages and some of the same logic as an atheist or an agnostic and it's just a strange strange business you know there there is so much more that could be said about this stuff i i, I really meant to uh when i was laying my notes out for this i meant to address the idea of inspiration which mr mcclatchy correctly points out that it, the the mechanics of, of of inspiration and how it works and what it means is not super well explained in scripture as a, as a process um, but I have my own ideas about how it works, and, and I, I, I should have put some notes together for that, and I meant to, and I, I wasn't going to. I was, I was even going to talk about preservation, which is probably a big enough topic by itself. Because if you have, if you have, uh, uh, you know, if you, if you have Paul's letter and it's correct in 40 A.D., but it's not correct in 2023 A.D., then what good did it do for it, for us to even write it down? Lots more people have read it in 2023 than have read it in 40 A.D. Like I said, preservation is a history lesson in itself. It is a topic by itself. But here's what I try to do when I look at this sort of stuff. I try to remember what it was like to be lost. I try to remember what it would have sounded like a cop-out to me. If a man had come to me and presented me with a gospel out of a book that he only thought was 80% or 90% accurate, I don't know that I would have taken him seriously. If he had said, it's not inerrant, but it's reliable, that would have sounded comical to me. It's like a parachute that only has a 20% failure rate, or an airline pilot that uh, you know tells passengers he's pretty sure he can fly this thing. He's pretty sure the thing will get off the ground. I mean, what are we doing? Are we trying, are we trying so hard to sound scholarly that we wind up repeating the phrases and arguments and logic of the unregenerate or the apostate? I don't know, man. So I'm going to stick to my guns on this. The Bible is errant, is inspired, is infallible. Uh, 
it has all the right words in it. Um, and when I find something that doesn't seem to jive, when I, the, the trick is to keep looking. The answers are out there, or they're not. <laughs> but you don't throw the you don't throw the thing out just because there's something you don't understand. Okay, well I am done with this for now. I am going to get back to uh, what I do best um, as soon as I can figure out what that is. Um, thank you for listening. Thank you for putting up with this. Uh, we've had some tef- technical difficulties getting stuff out the door here, but uh, we'll we'll see how this unfolds. Well, this is Michael Street Preachers Corner signing off. Thank you for listening, and I will see you on the other side.